Well, hello, men. Uh, glad you are tuning in for our online Ironmen. Uh, my name is Michael Rice. I have the privilege of leading our men's ministry here at the church. And um, we are now studying a series on the I Am Statements of Christ through the book of John. And so it's a great time to, to return to this important theme of, of who is Jesus as, as he defines himself. Uh, certainly, we, we see lots of people in this world defining Jesus uh, on various terms and various opinions. And what better place to turn to than Christ's own, his own words? And so uh, we're excited for the study. We hope you enjoy it. We hope you grow through it as well. If you would like to join us in person, we meet Wednesdays at 9 a.m. in the morning and 7 p.m. at night. We'd love to see you. Uh, have a great time even just fellowship with the guys. Also, too, if you're watching here and maybe from home, feel free to send me an email, uh, you know, get a hold of me somehow. I'd love to just say hello and see it, see how you guys are doing and, and even meet you guys there. Um, so uh, we are excited for this. Hope you enjoy and that this is encouraging for you. Thanks. Because Stephen's an amazing character that we're going to find surrounding Paul in some great times. If you open that Acts chapter six, that's where we're going to begin. And I just want to preface something with Stephen here. There, there's a lot that happens around Stephen in these, in these couple chapters. I'm going to work on the character of Stephen as opposed to everything that's happening around him. So if I'm skipping over some scripture and uh, you guys start to throw stones at me, please slow down. A lot to say, but, uh, and a lot can be said, but I'm going to focus uh, strictly on the character today. Also, I tend to talk fast because most of my teaching has been with junior high and high schoolers, and if I talk too slow, uh, they start to, to lose any concentration. So if I start talking fast, just give me one of those, like, hey, <laughs> slow down, Speedy, all right? So, Stephen, as, uh, as we begin, I, I, I was having a hard time with this title, and I didn't know where to go with it. And something stuck out about Stephen that was different than um, I had ever imagined. Stephen, his name actually comes from like the root word or, or the origin of the name comes from Stephanos. Stephanos being a victor's crown, which is why we have a title of victor's crown. I think that Stephen lives up to this victor's crown mentality. The other type of crown that is talked about in the New Testament is called a diadem, which is an inherited crown or a royal crown. That's what we normally are experiencing, but this victor's crown that we're talking about is something that when someone is courageous or does something that's far above and beyond, um, they would receive a crown and or someone who enters a race that is to be run and they win, they would receive this victor's crown. And I'd like to present this man, Stephen, who is presented to us as this man who's about to run a very, very fast race. So let's pray. We will jump into God's word. So I'm excited about God. Not only do you give us examples of great men, uh, but you give us example of great men who do things that aren't always right, and you always seem to redeem each and every one of us and each and every one of them. And I pray that through the courage of Stephen, we're able to see in our own selves the things that we are not only sure of, but have the courageous mentality to be able to stand up and be bold for your truth and for your glory. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, Stephen, we're going to start off. I'm just going to give you the introduction as to how it's going. Follow with me. Chapter 6 of Acts in verse 1, it says, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom whom we will appoint to this duty but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word and what they said pleased the whole gathering and they chose Stephen a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit and he chose six others that you can read beyond that and then they said these they set before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them and the word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And Stephen in verse eight, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Now I'm gonna stop there, even if your Bible has a break before that, just know that that's not where I wanted to stop and that's not where God told me to stop. He told me that Stephen had these great reputable characteristics about him. One of them, 
was that he was supposed to be full of uh, good repute, right? Good repute being a general goodness where everybody else would be like, yeah, you know that guy, Stephen, he's all right. He's, he's a good guy. I give him a thumbs up, maybe two. Then he's going to be full of the Holy Spirit or the Spirit. It's actually classified as the Spirit in the beginning. And then it goes down and he's also full of the Holy Spirit. So throw that in there. He's supposed to be full of wisdom. That's why they're choosing him. So this characteristic wisdom is, should be uh, something that he's hanging on to. Faith, that's important for someone who's about to serve the church and be one of the many disciples who's going to be uh, what they call a table server is what the, the 12 kind of give this this idea and then he has this grace about him he's full of grace and he's full of power and I like to think that if you are full of the Holy Spirit you're going to have power and there is this full of context that we're talking about and in this context full of is the equivalent to being controlled by so if you can imagine we instead of saying full of we could say he's controlled by the Holy Spirit or he's controlled by wisdom you could also say he's willing to surrender to because that's what being controlled by really is when I'm controlled by my wife I'm willing to surrender to her right when you're controlled by your boss you're willing to surrender to the boss so when it comes to grace, he's willing to surrender himself to grace. When it comes to power, he's willing to surrender his power to the Holy Spirit's power or God's power that's above him. And I think it's just a really good context because as we look at what Jesus did in his ministry and what Stephen does in his ministry, there is a parallel, right? And I think Jesus has all these exact same attributes. In fact, the attributes of Jesus we're going to see are kind of reflected in Stephen. So... Hellenists, I want to go back up to the top of this uh, chapter 6. A lot of people spend a lot of time on this. I don't want to. Hellenists, they're also known as Grecians, depending on how old the translation we are reading. They are Greek-speaking Jews, as opposed to like the Aramaic-speaking Jews, the, the direct Hebrews. So there's this conflict because the Greek-speaking uh, Jewish widows and, and the maybe Aramaic or like the, the natives, right, they uh, feel like there's a little a favoritism towards one than the other. So that's where Stephen comes on board. Stephen is the man that is going to try to help fix that so that the 12 can continue to give the word, give lots of prayer, do the ministry. That's his goal. That's what's happening. Okay. Um, then we have this great word of like serving tables. The idea of what he's about to do is what we get the idea of deacons from. In the church, we have deacons, we have elders, and we have pastors. But Right now, what we're talking about is a man who's just willing to serve, which is going to come into uh, play a little bit later. And then at the end, in verse 8 of what I was just talking about in the scriptures we read, it says that he was doing signs and wonders, great signs, great wonders amongst the people. And I just want you to know that if we look in Acts 2.43 and 5.12, this is actually regular back then. The apostles and the people that were going out into the, into the different towns and villages where they were at and who they were sharing the, the gospel with of Jesus Christ, they're doing signs and wonders. And this is causing and helping people see that what the people are actually telling them is truth. And it's so miraculous and so marvelous that there's no doubt for what we're going to be believing in. Follow me here as we jump back into God's word. It says then in verse 9, some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the, uh, sorry, Cyrenians and of the Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen. I like this. We have just just your normal table server, apparently, and we're going to get into some disputing here with some higher level uh, priests, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly investigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against the holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was... And most everybody, when you start talking about Stephen, you're like, what's, what's something we know about Stephen? His face shined like an angel. Yeah, he was the apostle, and maybe even the first martyr will come out of that. Well, we got this face that shines like an angel. And what I loved about this was he is, he's brought before the council. He's wrongly, falsely accused, 
right? Parallel with Jesus here on this one. He's falsely accused. But then he has this uh, idea that he's not only against um, the, the God that everybody's worshiping, but he's also against Moses. And Moses is actually really funny because when he goes up to talk to God on Mount Sinai to grab the new oracles and the tablets that are going to have the Ten Commandments on them and to come back down, it says in, uh, in uh, Exodus chapter 34, verse 29, that Moses' face shone because he had been talking with God. And or your translation may say speaking. I looked at a whole bunch of different translations. I was trying to find something else. But essentially... Moses was in such a direct communication with God that when he came down, he had a different illumination about him. Stephen is brought before. He was actually debating at the beginning of this. Now he's not debating. They just brought him before, and now they're accusing him. I kind of wonder, because we don't really know what Stephen's doing here, if, uh, if he is just so Christ-like that the reflection of the sun radiates so much out of him that he's there. Maybe the power of the Holy Spirit is making him look like this angel figure. Or maybe he's so deep in prayer, he's in such a direct communication with God that God is just illuminating his servant. God is willing to show everybody else that he is telling some truth. There was a... uh, a quote that I had uh, right above from Warren Wiersbe, it says, Stephen parallels the way the Jewish leaders treated Jesus. They f- first, they hired false witnesses to testify against him. Then they stirred up the people who accused him of attacking the law of Moses and the temple. And finally, after listening to his witnesses, they executed him. As we kind of continue into what's going on, I just, I think that this angelic, persona that he's experiencing is because not only is he full of the spirit and he's controlled by all the wisdom, grace, faith, he's, uh, he's willing to be in direct communication with God, even at a time where he has no one else to speak to except for God. As we jump into what Stephen's only reply is going to be in Stephen, in, in chapter 7, verse 1, it says, And the high priest said, Are these things so? And so all these accusations, Stephen, are these things real? And he gives this sermon that is amazing. And I, I highly encourage you guys to read it. I don't want to dissect this sermon, um, but I'm going to give you a couple quick little blips about what's happening. So Stephen, is this so? And he says, uh, well, kind of. And he starts to give high priests and scribes a history lesson on their own people. You think they need it? It'd be like me up here preaching to you guys. You, you think, you think I, I feel like I'm in deep water, as, as my man, man Lee said earlier? I feel like I'm in deep water. But anyways, he, he goes and he says, first off, you got this guy Abraham. You guys remember him? Abraham? That's right. God actually promised he was going to give Abraham the offspring and a land, right? And Abraham's like, I don't have any offspring. He's like, right. And by the way, when you do have offspring, they're going to be sojourners in the land until um, I enslave them for 400 years. And then I'm going to let them, you know, kind of come out so that they can worship me. And they'll finally have a heart for that. And then he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys a covenant with your people. It's going to be called circumcision. We're going to handle that. Everybody, everybody here has that? Cool. So as Stephen's talking about their circumcision of body, he moves on. He says, then we had Isaac and Jacob, and Jacob had Joseph, and Joseph was one of the 12 patriarchs. And he's, this man, Joseph, was thrown into slavery by the other 11 patriarchs. And he went, and he was imprisoned, and then he rose to power under Egypt, and he went from slave to ruling power. And then, and then the Israelite people were able to be saved through him because the patriarchs got hungry at some point. And where was the food? With Joseph. Joseph was able to establish that the people of God could, could then multiply and fill, fill the, the, the land until a new ruler came into play. And that new ruler came in and said, hey, we got we to gotta stop this Hebrew go around here. Let's start getting rid of the babies, which leads us to Moses. Moses comes out. He gets shipped off by his parents to a boarding school at the Pharaoh's palace. And while he's there, he's raised up with all the Egyptians, right? And the Egyptians take him as his own. He takes himself as an Egyptian until he sees one of his brothers being wrongfully uh, taken and beaten and taken care of. And he, he takes the matters into his own hands. He accidentally kills one, not accidentally. I'm pretty sure he, he deliberately did this, but he, he kills one of the Egyptian, and uh, then he's called out. 
and the Egyptians start to reject him. So he flees. He goes to this land. And when he gets to that land, he's in a desolate place. He finds this burning bush. That burning bush then sends him back to Egypt, where he is then to take all the Israelite people. We know the story. He crosses the Red Sea. Those people get on the other side. He says, I'm going to go talk to God. He goes and talks to God, brings back down the new oracles. And he says, this is what I have for you guys. And they're like, we got a calf. It's better. In fact, I don't, I don't even want to hang out with you, Moses. Who made you ruler, judge? Him? You heard that? We're going we're gonna to see if we can find our way back to Egypt. And Stephen's like, don't, don't you guys remember that they, they rejected him? Our fathers, they did that. And then after he gets to Moses, he, he says, Joshua, he was there to carry these oracles on because Moses, as you know, we got stuck, couldn't get to the promised land, but, but Joshua carries them over and they're given a tent so that while they're wandering in this desert, they're able to actually have a place to meet with God, to be able to, to bring themselves to God in such a way that God says, this is what I want. But, but then David says, you know what, God, I, I would like to ask to build the temple. And God's like, ah, I mean, I, I'm just, just a tent thing. And David's like, no, no, it's going to be amazing. And God's like, okay, whatever. I, I, obviously I can't control here. Well, he can control the fact that he's not going to let David do it. But Solomon is able to build a temple. But Solomon, I'm not even sure once he builds that temple, is uh, making it for the pleasing of God. In fact, God says in uh, Stephen's speech, if you go to chapter 51, sorry, if you go to, sorry, 49, there we go. God, in, in reply to what this is, uh, what, what I've just said, he says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is this place of my rest? Did not my hands make all these things? Like God's like, I, I don't want this temple. You guys made this temple for yourselves. And what's funny is the Jewish people, especially at this time, have made so many different traditions, laws, and rules that it's so hard to follow. It's not even bringing God to it. So... Stephen then smacks him with the heavy hit. Nicely, kinda. Verse 51. Chapter 7, verse 51. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart. Remember, we had circumcision at the beginning here, which is bodily. We're, now we're on the heart. You're, you're missing it. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And... They killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you now betrayed and murdered. We're talking about Jesus there. And who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Because you guys had everything. Our fathers messed this up. They rejected everybody. Uh, and then the next generation, they messed it up. And then, by the way, we got, we got the actual God man with us, Emmanuel. And guess what we did? Good work. We killed him. We're rejecting God all over, he says. He says, I, I, don't, I don't know what, what you think is going to happen. After calling these guys complete hypocrites of themselves, um, they start to lose their minds. Now, before I get into that, Stephen, at this point, has made some extremely bold claims, including telling these scribes and, and Pharisees and high priests, their own story, stuff that they should be like raised up knowing. And after telling them this bold accusation, he hits them with truth. How is he able to do that? You know, Stephen, I already mentioned, he's called to be a table server, but can you imagine when Stephen got to heaven, he finds his mom, he's like, mom, hey, yo, Stephen, how are you doing? He's like, I'm great. You wouldn't believe it. I made it into the Bible. It's super cool. They don't say anything bad about me. It's all good. She's like, all good? Even when you cheated on your spelling test in grade school? <laughs> not even in there. What about when you, you know, took the dog and, no, nope, not there. What about when you were mean to your sister? Mm-mm. No, nope, nothing but good. There's a few characters in the Bible where we're like, man, that guy was perfect, right? There's even like Enoch who was and then was not. And he's taken up because he walked with God. I just want everybody to, to be in common terms here. Stephen had a conversion. He's not perfect. He's a man just like we are men. He, he, he's, he's not a, a born into I am inherited with my diadem, my royal crown. He's a man who has been changed and he is running his race to win his crown. And he's working on it. And I, I guarantee that crown is just to be given to the, to the God who he is serving. 
A lot of people wonder where this conversion came from, when he was converted, how he was converted. Some people think that it's when Pentecost was happening, because obviously this is early church. So they'll say, hey, he's a Greek-speaking Jew. Maybe this is when he came to faith. The apostles are speaking in tongues. They're finally speaking his language, and he receives it. I'm going to give you guys this little perspective that I have, and I've heard it over, um, and it's not from me, but just imagine with me. Go with me to a place. It's like a Friday night, and we decide we're going to be having a barbecue, and all of us join in together, and we're going to have a sermon with it, and it's going to be great. And as we're in the middle of worship and sermons going on, a man enters. And as he walks up, he kind of looks scraggly. And somebody, we're not sure if we, we know who he is. He hasn't been around. Maybe he even smells a little funny, and we're not sure. Say, oh, hi, hi sir, can we help you? So, oh, yes, yes, um, I'm God. <laughs> and we'd all, we'd all chuckle. That's good. That's good. I mean, essentially, you can name yourself whatever you want and go through the process. G-O-D, God. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's good. Maybe, maybe you forgot your meds, sir. Why don't you just have a seat, see if we can get a pastor on him. Come on, help this guy out. No, 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 no. Seriously, I'm, I'm God. I'm, I'm here to give you a message. Okay. So as we go back and forth a little bit, we finally come to a point where we say, okay, if you're God, prove it. That's what we want to know. We want, all right, go ahead, prove it. Signs and wonders are happening like crazy. If you got this, you got this. He says, okay. And all of a sudden, deputy sheriffs come racing into the worship center where we're at. They grab him, and as they're hauling him off, they're beating him. They're spitting on him. They're mocking him. And as they get to the lobby, they have beaten him to such a pulp, he's barely unrecognizable as a human. And then, just to make things worse, they tack him up with big, big nails on the, on the lobby wall, and he's hung there. We're just like, what's going on? And as he starts to breathe his last breath, we can tell he's speaking to a father in heaven who he claims to be his father in heaven. And we're like, oh, man, this is, this is getting real. And then one of, one of the deputies grabs a spear and stuff, shoves it in the side, and he bleeds, and he dies. And we're like, oh, dude, we just killed a guy. What happened? Like, we didn't expect that to happen. And so we feel bad, and we pull him off, and we put him in a crib, and we're like, well, where do we take him? So we go down to Joshua Memorial, and as we get to Challenger, we find a mausoleum. We roll him into the mausoleum and, and, and his crib, and we, we make sure his dressings are all nice. We give him some ointments because we felt bad. We, by the way, he smelled when he first came in. And we close up the crib, and we leave, and we're like, man, what a terrible Friday. The next morning, we should take flowers. <laughs> That's the least we could do. <laughs> I mean, mere matter of fact, we challenged this guy to prove that he was God. Now he's dead. So we'll go. We'll take some flowers. So a few of us, we, we band together and we go and we take some flowers and we feel better and we, we, we leave. And, and that night, uh, one of us feels extremely restless and we, we just can't take it anymore. We got to figure out maybe who his family was, where he came from, who, who loved him, who didn't love him. We, we need to know who this guy was. So a few more of us, we go over and we, we get to the mausoleum, and as we look inside, the crypt's rolled out. It's empty. There's no body. And you think, well, who's still a dead guy? That's kind of crazy. Well, I guess that's over. So we walk out. And sitting in the parking lot on, on our car, there's a nice man. He's just leaned up on the car, and he goes, hi, hey, how you doing? Dude, you were, you were just dead the other day. And he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. I got holes, hands, feet, everything. Hey, I'm God. Oh, okay, cool, whatever, whatever you say. Yeah, yeah, I, I have a message for you. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I need you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. I need you to love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love people, not hard. I'm like, oh, okay, cool, cool. And all of a sudden he starts to rise into heaven. And as he ascends, all of us are fumbling over our pictures. <laughs> oh, man, I can't get my app, man. My kids, they always said a password. What's on? He's gone. An anybody get that? And everybody's like, no. No, we missed it. Well, how are we going to prove it to, to people? If, if we don't have any evidence, they're not going to believe us. So we're going to go to the people who are going to trust us the most. Maybe. <laughs> Depends on how many fibs you've given in your days. So you go to your friends and your family. He goes, you wouldn't believe what happened over the weekend. This man, he came in and claimed to be God. And then... The guards, deputies, they came, they beat him up. And they're like, come on. And all 12 of us that, are, that, that, that were really very, very sure about this and, and maybe were uh, around every piece of it, we're like, no, this is, this is serious. And finally, all of our family and friends feel real bad for us because we've all lost it. 
So they line us all up in front of all the other church members and they go, these people have lost it. We, we need to do some, some fixing here. And they go to the first one. And maybe that first one is Stephen at this point, but they go to the first. And they, the, the leader pulls out a gun. He says, hey, I need you to tell me the truth. Who's this guy you speak of? He says, I, I, I'm down here. He showed up. He's God. He, he, he explained. He said, love your Lord. And he said, love the people. And then he, he, he rose. Bang. First one drops. And then they move to the second. Hey, tell us. Who's this guy? Um, he, um, he was God. He, he did the, the, the didn't you, you heard him? Thanks. But uh, bang, we shoot him in the knee. Maybe torque him a little bit. This goes down the row to each 12. Now, you could say that 12 guys bound together and they're all crazy enough to make a big lie about it. Or you'd have to assume that maybe they were telling some truth. And if they were telling a lie, there's only two reasons we really lie. To get something we want, like really want, or to get out of something that we did. So those two things... I don't think they're going to get away with anything by saying, okay, okay, we, we made it up. And what are they going to get? Famous? Dead and famous? Right? There's, there's no win here. So maybe the first two guys could fall for it, but those next? I mean, come on. I think Stephen's wrapped into this group of men who are so sure about what they have seen what they have heard with their own eyes. The way John says, we, we, we know because we've seen, heard, we've touched, we've tasted. Jesus is the God. You have these men that are willing to die for it. So the first C in that acronym that I have is the character of the witnesses. You got a man that, that is of great character as a witness. Maybe he's also seen the other witnesses, the other 12 that are, are standing right there by him. The character of the witness is so huge to his assurance of faith. The next thing would be a location. You guys, anybody know where this whole Christianity thing kicked off? Starts with a Jerusa, right? <laughs> So Jerusalem is where Christianity should be shut down at the beginning. The Jews should have had a rap on this. But it starts to multiply. It starts to multiply so quickly that the Jews can't even control it. Well, why does it multiply? Because of the great signs and wonders and the teaching and the truth that Jesus Christ had presented. Now, if some guy got off a ship and said, Hi, I'm from Lancaster, California. There's this guy, Jesus, I'd like to tell you about. You've never met him, but he is God we'd probably be like, oh, let's, let's figure this out. Especially 2,000 years ago when you couldn't just get on your phone and send a message across the world, right? The location is the epicenter of Christianity, and it should have been the easiest to, to silence, and it wasn't. So L, be the location. A, the absence of the body. This is a claim of faith that I'm giving you guys. So the acronym claim here is for the assurance of faith. The absence of the body. There's a few arguments that like Lee Strobel or, or Josh McDowell or Sean McDowell, Frank Turek, um, any apologist that you guys love, uh, that they'll give. And other people have said, well, maybe, maybe he was just badly wounded. Jesus, he, he didn't die. They pulled him off the cross too early, and uh, he was just badly wounded. Sure, sure, sure. And then we wrapped him up in a bunch of burial cloths, and we poured ointment all over him, and then we closed him up in a tomb after being completely beat and battered, and you'd expect he'd get better. He, he, I, don't, I don't think that's going to happen. They'll just say that maybe the body was stolen. Okay, the apostles showed up and stole the body. They were able to get around the guards that were put directly in front of that tomb, whose lives depended on that Jesus guy being inside. Not sure that's going to work out. Well, what about what about if they just forgot where they buried Jesus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we put the most important guy of the day into a tomb, and we forgot where that was. We don't even remember the guy's name who provided the tomb. That guy Joseph of of, of where? Arima who? Doesn't matter. I don't think the absence of the body can be explained any other way than Jesus came out of that tomb, walked among us, gave us the teaching that we needed so that the the word would continue, and then he rose again. Uh, I is for the impact of the event. Honestly, if you really want to know how impactful it is, you can set your calendar by it. Go back a, a couple thousand years and 
mark the day. Jesus is proclaimed everywhere based on this impact, even into the jungles where there's not the word of God being written down and read. It's being proclaimed. We are sending missions, uh, missionaries everywhere in this world. And then the messages, power and endurance, which we know in Isaiah 40, that the word of the Lord is going to stand forever. This power and endurance of this message that you have in this text, this Bible, this is the most published book in the world by millions. Nothing is close to it. God made the most exciting book out there, the most read book, the most loved book, the most cherished book, and it's for us, and we need to be able to hold fast to it. Now, go back to this beautiful text with me. In Acts chapter 7, we're going to finish right here. Sorry, 751. Actually, I'm going to continue down to 50. 54. How does this affect Paul? And Saul being the Paul that we know. Um, sorry. Now, in verse 54, chapter 7. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged, right? Because he just, I mean, Stephen just called them all sorts of names and degraded their entire intelligence on who they thought their dads were and their, their dad's dads and their dad, dad, dads were. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God in Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. They cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And... As they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Stephen, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, parallel to Jesus. And in verse 60, and falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So I have down there a couple of reasons that I think Stephen's message, Stephen's martyrdom is so incredible. The person of the, of the church persecution of the church begins right here where Saul actually says that he's the one who started this persecution. Saul is the one who gave the thumbs up for the, for the stoning of this man, Stephen. Then not only is, is this word to be scattered out immediately because of all the believers who are going to the ends of the earth now because of this, Number two, Saul actually talks about Stephen being in his own conversion story. We see that in Acts chapter 22, verse 20. He talks about this constant reminder of Stephen's blood that was shed at his approval. Can you imagine having something in your mind you just can't get rid of? Maybe you can. Maybe there's something like, like me. I, I have many things that haunt me in life and many things that I wish I could change but I don't live in the concept that I have to. I know that God's taken care of of all things. However, Stephen has this burning memory. And he goes, you wouldn't believe it. That guy, Stephen, I couldn't get it out of my head. And then I met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and he told me all these things. And I keep, keep going back to Stephen. And as soon as I became Paul, I knew that that man, Stephen, everything he said was completely true. I knew I was stiff-necked. I knew I was, I was arrogant in heart. I knew I was uncircumcised, but not in the heart. I knew that the God above wanted me to do something bigger and greater, and I was showing up to my temple for myself. The biggest move that I like from Augustine is that he says, if Stephen had not there prayed, the church would not have Paul. Even a man full of grace, willing to pray for the man who's given a thumbs up, may have been the one that caused this church to continue to grow, for Paul to be one of the most published authors by the divine Holy Spirit. There's a lot that we can do from being a table servant, but I just want you to know that table servant went from being willing to serve the widows to being the uh, strongest, most courageous standing man in front of the highest leaders. Essentially, it'd be like after church, uh, we asked if you would just vacuum. And then the following Sunday, we said, hey, we, we need you to, to speak from the pulpit. God, give us the courage. Give us the assurity of faith. Give us the willingness to be courageous, even when we seem to be lacking. 
Help us to know that there are men who have gone before us who have not only ran their race, but they have received a crown of victory. God, we pray that you would just continue to work through us as we run our race. And we will hold the crown that we have as an inheritance until we see you again. And we pray that the, the crown of victory you give us, we can give to you for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.